Good morning, all you magnificent melon heads. Happy Inflation Day. Today is Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. Did you hear that sound? That was the sound in unison of market participants all around the world taking a look at that CPI and saying, Mother of God, what just happened? The Consumer Price Index for the month of March was just released. We got our inflation report. And good God, folks, headline inflation, 3.5% year over year. That is up from the 3.2% we had last month and higher than the 3.4% the market was expecting. Not good. Energy, a big contributor there, obviously, but it wasn't just energy, guys. That's the thing. It wasn't just higher gasoline prices. It wasn't, oh, the Red Sea or something happened in Syria. That is not what's going on here because core inflation which strips out volatile food and energy, came in at 3.8% year over year. That is unchanged from the previous 3.8%. And it's higher than the 3.7% that the market was hoping for, which means that our current rate of core inflation coming down, let's see, it'll take freaking never before we get core inflation back down to the Fed's 2% target. Now think about this, guys. We have virtually declared victory over inflation, right? The Fed has patted itself on the back. We think our plan is working, the lag effects and all this other stuff. And yeah, we're data dependent in the totality of incoming data and we're going to be... And what do we actually have? Step back from all the language, step back from all the rhetoric and all the hopeful articles that are written in the financial press. We've got core inflation that is still nearly double the targets, the Fed's target range. Yeah, inflation is way down from its peak, but it's nowhere near the target, and it's headed in the wrong direction. And this market, I mean, it's come back. Reality is starting to set in. You can see it. The market is just puking right now. I mean, the, this, that massive red candle when that report was first announced was unbelievable. Now, the market is starting to adjust its expectations, but keep in mind, just a few weeks ago, the market was saying, we're going to get seven rate cuts this year, starting in March. How's that going, by the way? How's, how's, how's that March rate cut? Meanwhile, the, the May rate cut is now like completely off the table. It's like 99.9% .9 likelihood that they don't cut in May. There's like a 0.1% chance that maybe they cut in May. And meanwhile, all the traders on the NASDAQ are like, so you're saying there's a chance. It's all that one in a million talk, baby. Come on. So, guys, this is the very textbook definition of sticky inflation. Inflation is not coming down. Yeah, we had energy contributed a little bit to the increase last month, and that, that had an outsized effect here. But core is not coming down. Certain things, there, there's actually like a, pretty much an across-the-board increase in a lot of the categories that people aren't really all that worried about, like food away from home, like apparel. Um, transportation services is still ridiculously high and still trending in the wrong direction. Car prices are coming down. Certain categories are moving in the right direction, but that's mainly just a function of the fact that nobody can afford this stuff anymore because inflation is so bad. And I just want to add, guys, that we are now just two days away from the beginning of bank earnings. So here's what here is potentially the table that is being set up right now. And this is why Jack has Perma Bear written in invisible ink on his sleeve here. I wear it, you know, it's, my bias is out there for everybody to see. My bias is in a downward direction. But we just had a CPI that told us you cannot cut rates. All right, that's what CPI just told us. If you, if you cut rates, you're going to make inflation worse. People are still suffering from inflation from last time. If you go cut now, all hell's going to break loose. Now we've got bank earnings coming up in a few days here. Big banks will probably be okay, but the regional banks, watch out for those regional banks. So what happens with CPI telling you, you can't cut rates, and the banks telling you, we can't keep the rates this high, then what happens? That is the corner the Fed is painting themselves into. And that, I think, is why the market is freaking out right now. And well, why don't we shrink my big melon of a head and take a look at that market that is freaking out right now because it is ugly out there today, folks. 
And just a reminder, if you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button and that notification bell right next to it. We do this every morning. We do this every CPI release. We go live at 9 a.m. every So have your coffee with the Melon Heads every morning. And if you are not new, don't forget that big, beautiful thumbs up button for the YouTube algorithm. It really helps me out. And wow, look, look at the S&P 500 futures down 75 points right now. And now you can kind of tell why I said the market is just saying mother of God. Look at that red candle down. These are five minute candles on this chart, guys. S&P currently down 1.4% ahead of the opening bell. Now, look, I don't usually trade around CPI because the algorithms are in the driver's seat. Uh, I'm having a hard time picturing anybody buying this dip today, to be honest with you. And unless the Fed comes out and immediately starts jawboning market higher, you know, I don't know, maybe Cash Carry comes out and says a thing, although he's been pretty hawkish lately. Maybe Loretta Messer, I don't know. Uh, but I'm having a hard time finding the case to buy this dip right now, especially with bank earnings on the horizon here. But the S&P right now is not looking so good. The Dow is also not looking so good, down 1.2% or 466 points lo lower ahead of the opening bell and still heading lower. You know, yeah, there was a little bit little, little bit of buying going on down here, but now we're heading back lower again. Uh, the dust has still not settled from this report. We'll see where we go. But wow, look at the NASDAQ leading the way lower, 1.56% to the downside, 287 points lower on the NASDAQ, most of that coming in that just initial few minutes after the report was released. Now let's look at the U.S. dollar. Wow, you think we got a stronger dollar today? Shout out to my cousin Brian, who was hoping for a higher Dixie today. Well, well, cuz, I think you got what you were looking for. Check out the green candle on the Dixie. We have got a sharply stronger dollar this morning, 104.79. That is 64 basis points higher. Uh, look, less aggressive Fed, less likelihood of Interest rate cuts in the U.S. Meanwhile, Europe and England seem like they're on autopilot towards rate cuts very soon. We had Switzerland already cut rates. Japan is being laughably weak with their interest rate hikes, raising rates by 0.1% from negative 0.1 to zero. So the dollar is uh, the only game in town in the Forex market right now. You got people are running the dollar, selling assets. And so that has a strengthening of the currency. And now that's going to put downward pressure on assets pretty much across the board. And that's what we're seeing, not just with stocks. Take a look at the bond market this morning. Bloodbath in the bond market here. We got the 30-year treasury as of uh, 8.59. So these, these only update about every 10 minutes here. Uh, but as of a few minutes ago, the 30-year is at 4.580, up eight more basis points. Remember, bond yields are inversely correlated to bond prices. So people are selling off bonds until the interest rates rise. Why are they doing that? Besides the less aggressive Fed, hey, it looks like inflation is coming back. Inflation is going to be worse. And so if the value of the currency is going to go down, people are going to demand higher interest rates in order to lock up their currency for 30, 20, or 10 years. So we got higher rates on the long end of the yield curve this morning. The 10-year, which updates every minute as of 9.09 a.m. Eastern Time, 4.512. That is up almost 15 basis points this morning. The 10 year is running like crazy here. This is not good for the economy, guys. Interest rates is the price of money. And our economy, even though all, all the people in the financial press will tell you we nailed the soft landing and it's really a strong economy, it's the best economy ever. Uh uh. That is not the case. Take a look at that business optimism index from yesterday. This economy is on life support because the cost of money is so high, relatively speaking. I get it, it was higher 20 or 30 years ago, much higher. But, you know, we didn't have a debt pile like we have now 20 or 30 years ago. Um, so this economy cannot afford interest rates like this for very long. The two-year Treasury is at 4.963. That's up 21 basis points. Wow, look at the two, the three years, up 22 basis points. I mean, the, the bond market is getting crushed here, guys. Now, the one month at 5.39, that's up about two basis points. That one doesn't really move because that's held in place by the Fed. Uh, but we have got lower bond prices, higher bond yields. Now let's look at commodities. Well, gold bulls, it was fun while it lasted. Anyways, it's not all bad news for precious metals, right? I mean, gold is down. Gold does not like a stronger dollar. Gold does not like higher interest rates. Now, for the last couple of months, gold has rallied in the face of higher rates and a stronger dollar, despite those things, just because gold was expecting inflation to keep getting worse. And it looked like the Fed was going to cut interest rates anyway. 
Uh, but right now, such a shock in interest rates and such a so much additional strength in the dollar this morning. Gold is not taking that well. So gave back some of its gains, but still gold is performing phenomenally well here. June gold futures, $2,349. That is down about 13 bucks this morning or about a half a percent. Silver is just barely clinging to those gains. Look at silver, May silver futures at $28 even, still up about two cents, although spot price of silver is starting to head down now about 1%. So looks like metals are not going to have a very good day here. Platinum is also down a half a percent. Palladium is down almost 2%. Crude oil, on the other hand, is up another 70 cents this morning, 85.94 for May WTI futures. That's up about 0.83%. And uh, Bitcoin not doing so well here, guys. Down another 1,300 bucks this morning, trading at $67,747 for Bitcoin. And just want to check in with the ETFs real quick. According to Swan Bitcoin, we had outflows from the Bitcoin ETFs yesterday of 18.6 million not a huge amount of outflows but all of that once again was grayscale which lost 155 million dollars of bitcoin yesterday all right now let's get into the reason we're all here this consumer price index the cpi and what a mess we got first of all let's go to the headlines here consumer price index for all urban consumers or cpiu increased by 0.4 percent in march on a seasonally adjusted basis the same increase in february so that doesn't sound so bad. Oh, 0.4. Oh, but that's just the month over month number. The year over year number at 3.5%. All right. So that there's your headline number. Let's scroll down to the actual chart to see where it's going on. All right. Now, over here, all the way on the right hand column, that is your year over year number, the 3.5%. That's the headline number that got reported. And then right next to that, you can see the month over month number, 0.4%. This is for the all items index. And then there's the February number, the January number, the December number. Now, here's the thing, guys. Look back over the, the prior few months, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.4. Do you see what's going on here? Do you see how we are trending in the wrong direction for headline CPI? Now, let's talk about some of the uh, some of the subcategories here. We had the food index is back to an increase, up by 0.1% for the month or 2.2% for the year. Now, food at home, unchanged at the grocery store. They're saying 1.2% for the year, 0.0, .0 for the month. Now, food away from home or restaurants, if you will, that one was up. It was up a lot more from 0.1 in February. Now it's up 0.3 in March. There's your services inflation. There's your wage pressure starting to show. It's getting more expensive to eat out, 4.2% year over year for food away from home. Now, the energy index was another big one. The energy index swung to a positive at 2.1. Uh, that's versus the, well, that is, uh, we had a lower month over month increase in energy this month of 1.1% for March. That's versus the 2.3% month over month number from February. But the comps is important. Remember, we're comparing to a year ago and we had some big numbers drop off a year ago. And so now the energy index is sharply higher. It was negative last month. Now it's positive by 2. 2.1%. Um, within that, virtually everything was up. Gasoline, now fuel oil was down a little bit there. Energy services was up. Electricity was up. Pipe gas services was up. Now let's talk about core inflation a little bit here. 3.8% core. Now that's the number that the Fed is really not going to like. The Fed isn't so worried about the headline number, although you know the press focuses on the headline number, and I think probably the algorithms pay attention to the headline number. But that core number at 3.8%, that's the number the Fed wants to see come down. And it is taking its sweet time coming down. And if you look at some of the month-over-month -month numbers, well, we're getting bigger. So, yeah, we had 3.8% year-over-year. But look, three consecutive months of 0.4% month-over-month inflation in core inflation. It's not coming down. That is the sticky inflation that Jerome Powell has been warning us about. It will not come in. And at the current rate that it's falling, it's going to take more than three years to get to the Fed's target. This economy does not have three years. Uh, let's talk about some other things, some, some other notable exceptions here. New vehicles. We actually had a second consecutive month of negative price movement in new vehicles. I think those price cuts at Tesla, the EV bubble popping, that's starting to show up in CPI a little bit here. We had a negative 0.1% month over month number for new vehicles. Used cars and trucks, we had a big negative number, minus 1.1%. 1 
That's probably being driven by affordability. People can't afford these interest rates. So we got a negative 2.2% year over year number for used cars and trucks. Uh, apparel. Now that's one, this is one of those sticky inflation numbers here. Look at apparel, 0.4% year over year. That's not a, a huge number. Clothes getting a little bit more expensive on an annual basis, but look at the last few months of month over month numbers. We had zero, we had negative 0.7. That's uh, let's see, that was uh, December, then January. Now look, February, 0.6% apparel inflation. March, 0.7. Right Now, apparel doesn't get more expensive because of the Red Sea. Well, not directly anyway. Apparel doesn't get more expensive because of mortgage rates. Apparel gets more expensive because of labor costs, because of the price of cotton, because the price of electricity is going up. This is one of those sticky core inflation numbers that the Fed is worried about. And to see consistent moves higher in apparel, that's one of those things that says, uh-oh, maybe people are just getting used to higher inflation and maybe prices are just going up just because, because people are demanding higher wages, because that core inflation is sticky. Medical care commodities, 0.1% two months ago, 0.2% this month. There's another one of your core inflation numbers heading in the wrong direction, 2.5% annually. Now, the shelter index, that's a, that's a big one. About 60% of the increase in core inflation came from the shelter index. Now, I just did a video with my buddy Travis from Real Estate Mindset on Monday about this very topic. We have been seeing shelter inflation coming down over the last year or so, but it's starting to come down slower here. And meanwhile, rents are still rising. Home prices in some markets are still rising. And so the shelter index, it didn't come down again. The year-over-year -year number at 5.7%, that's the same as it was last month. And the month-over-month -month number at 0.4%, that's the same as it was last month. And that's largely driven by owner's equivalent rent. When they call people up, they say, how much would you rent your house for unfurnished with not, without utilities? And people just spout off an answer. Well, that number is staying stubbornly high. And then this one jumped out at me quite a bit transportation services. Now, I did a video, I guess it's about eight or nine months ago now, I did a video because Jerome Powell had been talking about how he wanted to see core non-housing services inflation come down. All right, now that's a mouthful, right? Core means no food, no energy. And then non-housing services just means something that isn't rent that he wanted to see those numbers come down. He, he was convinced that the rent was going to come down on its own. It kind of did, but not all the way. But the biggest component of core non-housing services is transportation services. And look at what that one is doing. Look at the last few months, 1% month over month in December, 1.4% in January, 1.5%, I'm sorry, 1.4% in February, 1.5% in March, and now an annualized rate of 10.7%. Transportation services is heading in the wrong direction. That is that key core non-housing services going the wrong way. All the reasons Jerome Powell told us he might cut rates, all the things that would make him want to cut rates, we're not getting them. And so that's why the market is freaking out this morning because it's having to adjust its expectations for those Fed rate cuts. Now, let's take a look at what those expectations really are. Right now, we've got, uh, this is looking at CME futures. This is the likelihood of what the Fed funds rate might be at the end of the FOMC in May. Right now, you got 98.4% likelihood that they do nothing in May and only a 1.6% chance that they actually cut in May. Now, I took a snapshot before CPI came out. This is what that chart looked like before the CPI report. It was at 97.2 and about 3% for a rate cut in May. So still some people are out there clinging to hope. There's still some people out there saying, you're saying there's a chance we get that rate cut in May. In my opinion, no. In my opinion, that needs to be zero. They are definitely not going to cut interest rates in May, not unless all the banks just suddenly blow up. And I just don't think we're going to get that. Now let's talk about what the market was foreseeing in June, all right, before, before the CPI came out. Let's look at what we're at right now. Right now, the odds of no rate cut in June are 82.3% that the Fed does nothing in June. That's a big move from where we were. Only about 17% likelihood that we get any rate cuts in June here. Now, take a look at where we were before CPI came out. Boom. Only a 25% chance 
that they do nothing in June. So we went from 25% no cut to what is that now? 80%, 82%. So it looks like June is now off the table. I mean, look at where we were just a few hours ago, or not even an hour ago, just a few minutes ago, folks. This is what that curve looked like. And now here we are. So, I mean, at, right now the market is saying June ain't even going to happen. Now, let's see. July, the market is saying, is July still the most likely? Wow. July won't update. Looks like, here we go. Now we've even got most, we've even got a, a, a probability of nothing in July here. 58.8% that they don't even move in July now. Only about 40% likelihood that we get rate cuts in July. So the market is repricing its expectations for the Fed here. September, what do we got in September? Is the market at least saying it's a, it just, the website is really, there's a lot of people on this website right now. It is lagging here. I can't even get this thing to update. Okay, here's the December probabilities. We've now got almost 12% likelihood of no cuts this year. Wow, that is new. 12% chance that they don't even give us one rate cut this year. That is how worried about inflation all of a sudden the market is. Remember, this was seven rate cuts just a few weeks ago. We've got 33.4% chance of one rate cut, 34.4% chance of two, and then 16% chance of three. So right now, the market on average is pricing in what? About one and a half rate cuts this year. So the, the amount of rate cuts that the market is expecting since just this morning have been cut in half now. We went from from just under three to now it looks like just under one and a half. The market is really adjusting its expectations for where we're going to be in December here. And that means, guys, prices need to head lower. Stock prices need to head a lot lower because all of these stocks, the S&P, the Dow, the NASDAQ, they're all priced based on five, six, seven rate cuts this year. Those are not happening. And I just want to check in again to see, okay, so the market is still kind of trading sideways from where we were. So at, at least this sell-off, has stopped for the moment, uh, but things are not looking good for the dovish rate policy that I've heard so much about in the first few months of this year. Uh, let's talk about a couple of other things, guys. Here, let me show you the chart. First of all, here is the chart of the actual inflation rate. All right, now let's look at like five years, okay? So let let's take this with a grain of salt here. Inflation went way high, you know, peaked at 9.1%. It came way down. And then they started talking about dovish policy, and you can see it crept down a little bit, but now it is definitely trending up. And if you look at in the last year, you know, again, still overall a trend down, but now three consecutive months of higher inflation prints, three months in a row. Now it's a trend. It's no longer a fluke. It's no longer noise in the chart. Inflation is heading higher here. It's not heading higher in a big way. It's just barely moving, but it is higher nonetheless. Now take a look at core inflation. Now this is over the last year also. And this is the problem here because the the the, the decline in core inflation is basically done here. It's, it's now taking 2 months for every 0.1% decrease in core inflation. And we're at 3.8, right? Which means we need what 36 months at this rate. It's going to take another 36 months to get core inflation to the Fed's 2% target. And guys the market doesn't have three years. Three years at these interest rates, the whole country is going to be bankrupt. Inflation would be 30%, 40%, not inflation, um, unemployment would be like 30 or 40% if we keep rates here for three more years. Mark my words, rates will not be here for three years. Uh, but that just goes to show you that this this trend, you know, we yeah, core inflation was falling and then it just stopped and now it's barely even dropping anymore. Now let's talk about something else that happened this morning. Shifting gears from inflation a little bit, uh, the mortgage rates. Now, mortgage rates back over 7% last week. All right, we, we saw big spikes in interest rates. Why? Because we had those PMI reports came out last week. Everybody was expecting higher ex inflation because we saw it in the PMIs. We saw it in that business optimism index yesterday. The other economic data points were telegraphing this move in CPI. And so we saw a sharp move higher in interest rates last week, anticipating this report. It ended up being even worse than we were anticipating. Uh, but interest rates moved back up. The average 30-year mortgage went up to 7.01% last week. Now, interestingly enough, while that was going on, we had this one, the mortgage applications. Now, applications for a mortgage edged a little bit higher last week, 0.1%. That's not really 
you know, basically holding its current level. I'd expect it to drop because interest rates went up. It didn't. So that's a that's a little bit of an outlier. But it's the move in refinances last week. And my moderator, Mish, caught this one this morning. This is a little scary here. Um, applications to refinance a home soared by 10% from the previous week. As the surge in mortgage rates drove households to lock in contracts before risking a further increase in borrowing costs. This was triggered by a sharp increase in long-term U.S. Treasury yields with the latest data showing that average mortgage rates rose beyond 7% for the first time in five weeks. The development offset a 5% plunge in applications to purchase a new home. So applications to refinance a home last week, even though interest rates rose sharply, we had a 10% surge in applications to refinance a home. That is a terrible economic indicator. That means even though interest rates are going higher, People are still refining their biggest monthly expense, their mortgage payment, into a higher interest rate. Why would they do that? Because they need money. People are using their homes as an ATM. They're going deeper into debt, borrowing against equity that probably won't be there in a few months. And they're going deeper into debt. Why are they going so deep into debt? Because they can't afford the cost of living. They're using their home as an ATM. That is terrible news for the economy. That one just came out this morning. Also, you're not going to hear a lot about the mortgage applications because everybody's going to be laser focused on CPI today. But that's another indicator that just goes to show you guys inflation is killing people. And that's why I say this economy can't afford these higher rates for much longer. You've already got people borrowing at 7%, 8% to cash out, refi their house just to buy food or pay the electric bill. Can't last that long. Now let's go across the pond because we got more bad news out of China, the other economy that's going to hell in a handbasket. Fitch cuts China outlook to negative on a steady rise in debt. We saw something similar back in December from Moody's, and now we have got two of the three big rating agencies have cut China's debt outlook. I want to emphasize that is the outlook, not the rating itself. The outlook is the direction we think the rating is heading in. So this is like the precursor to a cut of the credit rating in China. When they cut the outlook, Fitch ratings revised China's outlook to negative from stable, saying the government is likely to pile on debt as it seeks to pull the economy out of a real estate driven slowdown. Growing uncertainty about the outlook for the world's second biggest economy amid Beijing's drive to make growth less dependent on housing could keep debt on a steady upward trend, Fitch said on Wednesday. China's government, which has been talking up the prospect of a turnaround in the economy, rapidly pushed back saying the rating company failed to reflect the role fiscal policy is shoring up growth, which helps to stabilize debt burdens. Financial markets were unfazed with the yuan steady. China's 10-year sovereign bond yield edged higher after trading little change for most of the day as investors digested the report. Uh, so China, of course, doesn't like their outlook getting downgraded. They're not being quiet about it. But the Fitch announcement, which matched a similar one by Moody's Investor Service back in, back in December, comes at a crucial time for China's economy. In the coming weeks, the government is due to release some key indicators, including first quarter growth, while the central bank will decide on a key loan rate. Financial markets are closely watching for clues about whether the economy has put the worst behind it after some encouraging numbers for manufacturing and exports earlier this year. All right, so financial markets are closely watching for clues about the economy. I've got a clue about the Chinese economy. How about this one? Also in Bloomberg this morning, Chinese cement maker halted after a 99% crash in 15 minutes. Okay, so the company that makes cement is down by 99%. Maybe that's a clue about the direction of the economy in China, which is usually dependent on construction and housing. Cement kind of important to that industry. Yikes, a 99% crash in 15 minutes. How'd you like to be holding that one? Tian Ri, how do you pronounce this? Tian Ri, Tian Ri Group's market has plunged to 140, their market value has plunged to 141 million Hong Kong dollars. That's a hard one to pronounce. Sorry, guys, that one tripped me up. A Chinese cement producer was in the spotlight after it suspended stock trading Wednesday following a sell-off that nearly wiped out all of its market value in the final 15 minutes of the previous session. China Tianrui Group's cement said trading in its Hong Kong shares had been halted at 9 a.m. local time pending an announcement related to inside information, according to an exchange filing. Based in the central Henan province, Tianrui stock plunged 99% to about five Hong Kong cents on Tuesday, 
cutting its market cap to 141 million Hong Kong dollars or about $18 million U.S. During the sell-off, about 281 million shares or a third of the firm's free float changed hands. Of that amount, more than 80 million shares were traded during the final few minutes of the session known as the closing auction. And take a look at that chart. Yikes, how'd you like to be holding that one? Wham, right at the close, it loses 99% of its value. Now, Tian Ruiz controlling shareholder Li Liufa and his spouse jointly own about 70% of that company, according to a filing in January. The cement producer also announced at that time that it pledged 97 million shares, or about 3.3% of its total, to secure a 12-month loan of up to 166.5 million yuan. So that's important when you pledge shares in order to take out a loan. You're basically you're putting your shares up as collateral. When those shares start to drop in value, the bank will call you up and say, you need to post more collateral against that loan or we're calling it. And well, that just started a cascade of sell-offs and this stock just absolutely crushed. Now, this is like pretty much a penny stock. But if you think the worst is behind us for the Chinese housing market, if you think the developers are going to recover and those buildings are going to get finished, Chinese cement makers dropping 99% in a few minutes doth beg to differ with that thesis that the bottom is in for China. I don't think the bottom is in there. Oh, my God. What a day. It, it's going to be a day, folks. Let's just put it that way. And I just want to say thank you very much to PS, who says David Hunter predicted next rate hike and then crash. Uh, look, nobody's talking rate hike yet, PS. Uh, but we did, for a very brief moment, Last week, we did have like a, a fraction of 1% likelihood of a rate hike did creep into that CME futures. Uh, keep an eye on that one today. We might have that one come back. So I'm not going to rule it out outright. As of right now, it's highly unlikely. But you know what? It's April, P.S. It's only April. So we get another one, another CPI like this. We get two or three more CPIs like this. You better believe those rate hikes will be back on the table. And man, you think you've seen Jay Powell squirm when he had to walk back transitory, if he's got to come in and start hiking again after he said we were done hiking for this cycle, it's going to be a lot of egg on his face for that one. So good call there, P.S. Again, right now, I'm going to say no to rate hikes right now, but I would not rule it out entirely. We need more data. We're data dependent. Now I'm starting to sound like Jerome Powell. Oh, man, you spend enough time around these guys. You start acting like them, don't you? Um, I think we need to see a few more hot CPIs before rate comes rate hikes becomes a, a real possibility. Um, but we're definitely trending in that direction, man. We definitely are. Thank you, sir, for the super chat, the support of the channel. And thank you very much to Jose Orozco. What's going on, Jose? He says, good morning, Jack. Good to see you. Coffee and cheers to the Melonhead. Right back at you, Jose. I appreciate the super chat, the support of the channel, brother. Thank you very much. All right, guys, it's going to be a crazy day today. The market has to reprice its expectations for the Fed rate hikes or Fed rate cuts. Um, what are stocks going to do here? Stocks have been running like the blazes this year, all expecting those cuts. And those cuts ain't coming anytime soon. So does that mean stocks have to go back to where they were a few months ago? Go look at where the S&P 500 was just a few months ago. It's a long way between here and there. Stocks got a long way to fall here. Inflation is sticky. It's trending in the wrong direction. The Fed will not be returning to Zerpenburr in May, probably not in June, maybe not even in July. It's going to be one of those days, folks. Thank you, everybody, for having your coffee with the Melon Heads and for joining us for this CPI report. Don't forget, if you're new here, hit that subscribe button because we do this every time CPI comes out. And we have this live stream every morning as well. So come have your coffee with the Melon Heads. Thank you guys very much. Thank you for the super chats. Thanks to my channel members and magnanimous Melon Heads, I appreciate everything you guys do for the channel. Looking forward to talking to you guys at, on Zoom this afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern Time on Patreon. And for my magnanimous Melon Heads on this channel, links down below to all that good stuff. Should you feel so inclined? Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Love you guys. Till next time, live small and dream big.